Hello and welcome to Languagecraft for a brand new episode of Let's Time Lapse. Now it's been way too long, we're actually about a month and a half late, because many of the team members who give me a hand with these episodes, or with this series, had exams to worry about. Thankfully I've been done with them for a while. But it was hard to get all together, and we did all the building in about a week with prior layouts we had made. So we got together in groups, or even just two or three of us for certain shots. As you can see, we're coming back to the castle today. We started it in episode 17, now it's time to go from a small countryside castle to something much more massive and impressive. Among other things, the wooden wall will disappear to make way for a much grander version of itself. So what a start! Instead of building, we're destroying what we did previously. And for once, it isn't for time lapse. You know, a lot of our team time lapses that we make are actually reversed time lapses, where we destroy the map block by block, and then I invert the footage. But this isn't the case, and it was actually a bit sad for us to destroy this palace. It looked really good, but we made a save of the map with it, for old time's sake, just in case. However, we have something very different in mind. Right off the bat, I start building a machine on the left, which was planned right from the start to fit with this large round tower, a catapult. I could also have built a ballista or a trebuchet, for example, and maybe I should have, because on my French channel, a lot of people thought it was a mistake to build a catapult. It's seen only as a siege weapon, and technology had moved past catapults by the 13th century. So I may change it, I don't know yet. Oriendo said that it was ac it actually made sense to have a catapult. So we'll see, you know, don't hesitate to tell me what you think. Another round tower like this one is planned for the opposite end of the castle, where there's just dark blue wool that you might see. We decided, however, that a catapult on that one wouldn't make any sense, since it would just be able to shoot the village from there. But at the moment, we're building one of the two entryways to the castle, the one for the route to the north, so probably the one that would be attacked. So we decided to protect it with a barbican, which is prevalent in fortified set which is prevalent in fortified cities like Carcassonne. It's a space between two doors, or a portcullis and a door in our case. If the attackers go through the portcullis and are stopped by the door, they'll be stuck and at the mercy of the defenders, who can attack them from a roof above. They can drop rocks, arrows, and even boiling water, sand, or tar. Not oil, that's a misconception. Oil was much too expensive. But sand is actually horrible. It's, you know, burning sand that goes between your armor plates and... Well, it's not pleasant. So anyway, it's definitely not a good place to be. You want to cross it as fast as possible, or even go around it if you can. We actually built the Barbican several times because we weren't too sure where we were going. Theo started off on an idea to cover part of the Barbican, but I didn't like it at all. I thought it was really no good, and we should have only the walls that surround it. Then Oriendo came by because we had a couple questions, and he said the Barbican wasn't bad, but we should push it further. So, change of situation, instead of only having a balcony above it, we covered the whole Barbican. We'll fly by it during the cinematic. It's a nice area. Here we're redoing the first enclosing wall that faces the village. I chose it for the thumbnail of the video because I absolutely love this view of the castle. Of course, it will only be complete with a wide round tower on the right and the top of the dungeon in the back. The wall looks great because, well, I think we did a good job, but most importantly because we kept the principle that I talked about during episode 17 of making all our patterns different, except of course for the two towers that flank the entrance although they differ a bit in height among other things. But the three parts on the wall on the left are different, even though they follow the same principles, the wall on the right is different, and no two towers are the same. That really brings something to the castle while keeping a consistency and a style for everything. As for the drawbridge, we had a lot of trouble. I wanted to use a technique I saw years ago that uses leads and animals for the bridge's chains, we trapped a chicken between the trapdoors above the bridge and attached the lead to the fence post on the bottom. Unfortunately, it was just a little too far, so we might change the position on the top. Even though we imagined the chains to be diagonal, they were mostly vertical. Two wooden arms would stick out above the bridge and come up with it. But we're going with iron bars for the moment. It's quite classic, but it looks good. 
Something else I haven't talked about yet is the fact that I removed all of the bank around the castle. This was planned from the start, and it really enables the castle to take advantage of its defendable position. Some people thought it should have been on the hill, but it simply needs to be easy protected, and this river protects two of its sides. That's why we removed the bank, so that no one can simply cross the river and place a ladder. If someone manages to cross, he will still be standing in water, focusing on not drowning. After a short period of rest, we started work on the Lord's Chapel, a very important building that we had originally forgotten. So I had this idea of adding a platform that ate into the outer bailey. So Theo went ahead and drew up some plans following some strange vision he had. Above that, we built the chapel, about which all of us have mixed feelings. The even-numbered pillars don't help for such a small structure. We had to rebuild the roof several times, we changed the dimensions several times. Some of us don't like the back of the chapel, others prefer it like that. That's the drawback of working in a team. We don't all have the exact same vision of things, but I still love building as a team. But it ended up being pretty nice, and corresponds to what we wanted. Since this isn't a church, it needs to be much smaller, much simpler. It can probably seat about a dozen people inside. Underneath, inside the platform, is the castle's cistern, which simply contains water to withhold a siege. Cisterns were often dug underground, but we liked this idea and have two entrances, one from the battlements and one from the inner bailey. I won't show you any of these in the video, you'll have to go exploring once the map is made public. The castle is full of secret passageways, I really had a field day. Most of them are normal corridors on one end, but have a secret entrance from the other side. In fact, there's one in the stables we're building, so don't hesitate to explore the castle to try to find all of them. You know I also plan on adding a passageway from the dungeon to the far away countryside, in case the outer bailey the inner bailey and the dungeon are taken, and the lord and his family need to flee. So we started building the inner bailey, and started with this ramp that we knew we wanted after the door separating the two baileys. We also have a small staircase going up to the chapel, and the entrance to the cistern is just behind there, next to the chests. We also have a trough for horses that would come up here. That's when we realized we didn't have any other ideas, so we added a stage to fill up the space in case there are shows put on for the Lord and his family. That's when we asked Oriendo to come by for ideas, and he reminded us of another building, which we had decided not to use because the Lord lives in the dungeon, which actually we're adding to as we speak, with an extra section atop and a small tower in one corner because it didn't look good to be completely flat from far away. This makes it just high enough. So the extra building was the loggia, oftentimes the Lord's residence, but what we didn't know is that it was also a place where receptions were held, where the banquets took place, and if there was a second story, where guests would be housed. So that's what Teo is building at the back of the inner bailey, with a long banquet table. It's a nice space that will prevent the Lord's private space from being invaded at every reception. Of course, the cinematic starts from the main square because I love this side of the castle. I think it's really the most well done. I hope you agree and that I'm not too vain by saying it, but as far as I'm concerned, it's really good. I'm also realizing that I didn't film any shots from far away. That will have to wait until episode 20 when we'll correct any mistakes and add little elements everywhere. I already went around the whole village with Oriendo to make everything more historically accurate, took notes on everything, but we also want to update the older parts of the village, um, architecturally speaking, which have aged in the last two years. Here we are entering the Barbican, but unfortunately we have our back to the little guard's window that is inside and that controls anyone entering the castle from here, for carts that deliver goods, for example. Now the large tent is obviously military, but I now realize that we forgot the kitchen. We decided that it would be in the inner belly to be close to the Lord. And the guards' quarters are in the two large round towers, where we placed a lot of beds. We already did all of the internal structures of the castle, but don't actually furnish most rooms, with a few exceptions like the loggia or the chapel. So we add posts and beams and torches, and for example in the cistern we have a pulley system for a bucket. 
So if you were to use this map, you could right away move into the village and perhaps live in the castle. What a place to live! In the entire castle you can see machicolation, the parts at the top of the wall which advance. We also have arrow loopholes all around the castle. I was very surprised to hear that those slits were called loopholes. I had only ever heard that word used in its figurative meaning. And of course we have the crenellation at the top of the walls and towers so that archers could take cover while notching an arrow. We have corridors all over the place in this castle. Even I have trouble getting my bearings sometimes because there are always many different routes from any point A to any point B. And finally, the road leading to the western entrance through the fields, from which you can also see the giant flag flying from the top of the dungeon in the town's green colors. We'll also finally have a name for this town in the next episode. Hopefully we'll be decided by then, we're having a lot of trouble with that. We were toying with a lot of ideas for the drawbridge area, but in the end, this really works, and it's highly defendable. Behind the bridge is a portcullis with a door behind it, and a barbican with a portcullis and door on the other side. To be honest, I'm really not too worried about the Lord's safety. Now here is the end of the episode, I'm really happy to keep building on this map. It's really coming along and coming together. As always, I was of course helped during this episode. Dudelash couldn't make it as he swamped with work, but Teofil helped out a lot, as well as Mimi Lala, Desd, and Bed. We're all really into the series. The last episode should come out in August and should be very special as it won't have a single theme, it'll just jump around to add to the whole place. I'm especially looking forward to redoing all the trees and bushes, that will really change everything. Thank you all for watching, and I'll see you very soon. Bye bye.